then you have also built a mechanism for memory as well. It's absolutely fascinating. Let me, uh, I have a, a couple of um, questions for you. Uh, at about what age, um, how, how long, uh, oh, excuse me, how far along in the development of the fetus um, is it before um, we're able to pick up sounds? And at what uh, decibel? <sighs> See, so that's a good question. I'm not actually an expert in this. So when in human gestation does will, will, will sounds be transduced? I'm going to guess here. You're going to you're going to guess better than me. So I'm going to I'm going to guess that at around that def that by six months you're definitely going to transduce sounds. It may be earlier than that, and I and I and I defer to people who really know about this sort of thing. This isn't my area of specialty. So. You know, I'm I'm probably off, give or take a month. Um, I think one of the things that's really fascinating about about human development, and one of the things that impacts our human experience of mating systems and attraction, is the fact that if we have to build this giant human brain, uh, there is a problem in that this big human brain, and our brain is about 1,200 cubic centimeters, it can't fit through the birth canal. As right. it is, it's a bit of a problem, uh, as, 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 as any woman knows. As a matter of fact, it turns out that death during childbirth is a uniquely human phenomenon. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Or, or our closest primate relatives don't have it. Orangs don't die in ch never die in childbirth. Chimpanzees, gorillas, never die in childbirth. Humans do. Wow, I never um, wow. Because we are pushing the envelope in terms of head size. So a human baby has a head uh, at birth that is about the size of a mature chimpanzee, about 400 cubic centimeters. So the human is born with about a 400 cubic centimeter brain, and it has to grow to be about 1,200 cubic centimeters on average uh, at maturity. And what this means is that humans have this amazingly protracted childhood compared to other animals. So whereas the human brain is undergoing massive growth from, from birth to age 5, and then much slower growth from age 5 up to age 20, and is not fully mature until around age 20, um, there's no other animal in the world that is that can't fend for itself at age four or five, other right. than humans. Right. Uh, and so this has driven a lot of specializations. So our 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 mating system, uh, and you know, obviously our human mating system has happens in lots of different ways with different individuals and across cultures, but the dominant institution is heterosexual marriage. Uh, monogamy, or at least serial monogamy, is cross-culturally dominant. It doesn't matter whether you're in London or in the bush in Papua New Guinea, that is the dominant cross-cultural institution. Now, if you look at most of our mammalian relatives, they don't have this. They don't mate for life. Right. Uh, they don't even mate serially monogamously. As a matter of fact, in most mammalian species, dad makes the baby and then runs away. Uh, or orangutan males don't stick around to help uh, uh, raise children. Um, and so what this has driven is a situation, whereas for most animals, the, the, the mom can raise the babies on her own just fine. But human children really, really benefit because they are so helpless for so long, they survive much better on the average if both mom and dad contribute to their rearing. Now, obviously, mom and dad can contribute in different ways. Now, you can think, yeah. of course, well, in our modern societies, well, there are plenty of single moms, and they're doing a fine job, thank you. Uh, and this is very true. But and keep single in mind, dads, I might add. And single dads. 
Uh, that's a very good point. And, you know, we get elaborated in all kinds of different ways, and there are gay folks that raise children very successfully, and there are, there are all kinds of ways things can be. But, you know, evolution is a slow process. You know, the, the technological and social innovations that have allowed for women living independently in, in our modern cultures are very, very, very recent. They're within the last generation or two. Uh, evolution in is a very words, slow process. In other words, in the last few seconds of since the time that we crossed the line into Homo sapiens sapiens. Exactly. Exactly. And so, and so really our, our, our brains and the mating systems that, that our brains support are not, are not, uh, uh, are not adapted to our latest of the moment modern urban existence. They are the average of what has been selected over, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of years of recent human history. So if somebody posed the question to you, um, ideally, would it be best for a child to be raised in a family where there is a mother and a father? As compared well, to a single parent, your response is going to be based on science and your understanding of evolution rather than some ideology. Well, we all have our ideologies, yeah. and, and, and scientists too, and I'm not exempt from that, and I have political ideas and ideologies just like everyone else. But what I would say is that, I mean, if you, if you live in a traditional society, if you're living in Papua New Guinea, and you're trying to gather food, and it's a pretty tenuous existence, I think the, a the answer is very clear. You're, on the average, you're much more likely to survive if you have both mom and dad around contributing to raise the children. If you are an upper middle class person living in New York City, the same, it, it doesn't necessarily hold. I mean, I think on average, uh, uh, I think uh, on average, uh, most of the data, even from modern urban societies, indicate that on average, kids do better uh, with two parents. But that doesn't mean that kids growing up with one parent in many situations can't can't be just just fine yeah uh, I think it's a lot harder in a traditional society for that to happen when you have different uh, pressures in terms of, uh, of even staying alive staying fed uh, uh, staying warm staying away from predators yeah, those aren't the things rule, that most though. of your th those aren't the things that most of your listeners are uh, are, 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 are concerned about. Unless you happen to live in the city of Wilmington, <laughs> close to Second <laughs> Street, Fourth Street. That's right, right. Well, that's a different. That's that. That's you're, you're absolutely right, and that's that's a different set of, uh, of 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 evolutionary pressures that are that are no less serious. Uh, you know what I thought would be interesting um, for our listeners, and this is backtracking a bit, but if you could um, um, briefly uh, tell the story of Phineas Cage. Oh, I've yes. always enjoyed this one from the time I learned it in, as an undergraduate and taught it in a high school honors course. Right. Well, so Phineas Gage, well, uh, let me preface this by saying that it's been known for a long time, long before this particular case, that people can sustain brain damage and this brain damage could change their cognitive abilities. So in other words, you get someone and they get, you know, injured in the head from a stroke or an accident or, or com, excuse me, or combat or what have you, and they may not have their cognitive capacities that they once did. They may have problems with memory or with uh, doing sums in their head or what have you. What was interesting about Phineas Gage, and this is a case that occurred in the 19th century, uh, is that it was the first example where someone sustained brain damage and it changed their personality. Yeah. And so here's the story. Phineas Gage was a, a railroad foreman who was working uh, on railroad construction in Vermont in the 19th century. And he had the, 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 the unenviable task of tamping the explosive charge in that would later be set off to level, level the roadbed. And he had a, a, long, a long metal rod, and he was 
tamping the charge into place and there was a spark and an explosion and horrifically it drew, drew it, it, it it drove this metal rod at great speed up through sort of through his eye socket, not actually piercing the eyeball, I don't believe, but at an upward angle so that it entered the upper curve of the eye socket, passed through the frontal lobes of his brain, and came out the top of his head. Now, the most astonishing thing was that he lived at all, because keep in mind, you know, there's no antibiotics in the 19th century. There's no...